Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, thank You that we can gather this morning in the name of Your Son. And we thank You for His promise that when two or three are gathered together in My name, there I am in the midst of them. And so we thank You, Lord, that You are here. And we ask that You would open up our hearts and our minds to Your presence. Make room in us for that which You desire to impart Set us free to give what you would have us give. And so we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. When we read the Gospel lesson, the story, of course, as it's called, the Transfiguration. We're on holy ground. Something powerful, unique, and very, very important is happening. Jesus had been telling his disciples that he was going to suffer, that it was going to be awful, that they would all scatter and deny him. He, something had to happen to prepare them for what it was that they were about to endure. And in the light of all of that, this happens, the transfiguration. That's why the gospel begins. In fact, look in your bulletin at, your, at the lesson. Let's look at it. After all of those sayings, this is where we pick up. And it begins by saying six days later. In other words, the author is intentionally trying to tie the teaching that Jesus had given in the previous chapter with what was about to happen right now. So they're, connect, they're connected in other words. So right, right after that, six days later, what does he do? He leads them up a high mountain apart by themselves. Now, this is important in terms of the geography because it's very much a part of the Jewish tradition that when, when his people go up on a mountain, things happen. This is where Moses, remember him here, <laughs> God appeared to him. The giving of the law happened. This is where out in the wilderness on a high mountain, Elijah met God and was fed by the ravens. There's this whole theme all through the Old Testament of people getting apart to be alone with God, often in mountainous wilderness settings, and God meeting them. So I'm sure as Jesus is taking this small little group, his inner circle, Peter and James and John, and they're going up on a high mountain at his invitation. They had to be saying, what's about to happen here? In other words, they know, just because of what they've been taught, that this may not be like it has been before. They're not going into a village where Jesus is going to preach and teach. You see, usually when Jesus would go off into a place like this, he'd go by himself. Remember, they have to go and find him. That's when he would go alone to pray, but not this time. This is different. He's taking these three, his closest companions, with him. So they go up there by themselves. We don't know where the rest are. Maybe they're out camping out there in the village. It doesn't say where the rest of the disciples are. But these three are with him. So what happens? He goes up and it says, and he was transfigured before them. And you think, well, what does that look like? His clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. In other words, and this is how these three would see this, the very light and glory of God was radiating through Jesus in that moment. I mean, can you imagine? If, you, if you've been taught all your life that when the glory of God comes, first of all, you've never seen it. All you've done is just read about it in the Old Testament stories. So you are entirely unprepared for what, this, what was going to happen. And, and there it is, right in front of you. Of course they were terrified. In fact, more often than not, when the glory of God appeared, somebody got struck dead. It was not good. And so here it is, Jesus, the one who they ate, talked, laughed, enjoyed each other's company, seen incredible miracles, right in front of them, this carpenter from Nazareth, 
who kept saying things that they didn't understand is literally like a light bulb turned on, radiating the very presence of God. They are seeing, as it were, God in human flesh. That's what's being shown to them. Which is why, even in the creed, we go God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Do you know that part of the creed? Mm -hmm. Not your head. This is interactive. Yes. <laughs> um, that's, that's a part of why we say this. This is what we're being shown in the transfiguration story. That God is manifesting himself visibly. Visibly. Right there so the naked eye can see it. This is not just some vision that they had in their head. It's something that they are, that's literally happening right in front of them in time and space. It's not a dream or a vision. It's bang, happening right in front of them. The light of God so radiating through Jesus that literally his clothes dazzle. And so, of course, they're, they're kind of out of their heads. What happens? And there appeared to them Elijah. He's there, Moses. And notice... Moses and Elijah represent the best of Judaism, the giver of the law, the prophets, the ones to whom the glory of God was manifest, the ones who themselves met God in very similar geographic settings, wilderness and mountains. In other words, what's happening here is Jesus is being shown to them as literally the fulfillment of everything that they had known as Jews. The very epitome of Judaism was being manifested in front of them. And what are they doing? They're conferring with Jesus. In other words, the picture here is, he is much higher than anything that was ever shown through Moses, that was ever shown through Elijah. Whether we're talking about the giving of the law or the display of the miraculous. We're in a different plane here. This is something brand new. Peter, impetuous Peter, always Peter, speaking out, not really knowing what he's saying. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. What he wants to do is create a shrine. This is where it happened. Get your ticket right here. Come and make your pilgrimage. Come and pray at the very same spot where Jesus and Moses and Elijah, you've seen those, right? That's what he's talking about. And notice the writer said he does not know what to say. In other words, this is not an appropriate response to what it is that's going on there. But he's beside himself, literally. I mean, remember, he's terrified. He's terrified. So God has to make this even clearer. As in, if you don't get it now, you'll get it right this second. Because what happens? A cloud, verse 7, overshadows them. And from the cloud there came a voice. A voice that they heard with their audible hear, ear. It's not just some little thing inside of them. And what does the voice say? This is my son. Different from Moses. Different from Elijah. And who does he call him? The beloved. The one whom I love and care. He is the one that embodies all of who I am. And what is the command? Listen to him. And what happens? The cloud lifts, and, when they, and they saw no one anymore but Jesus. In other words, God in this vision is making it very clear. Moses and Elijah embodied the best of Judaism, but now something new here that literally supersedes what was seen in Moses and Elijah. What was fulfilled in Mo is now in Jesus. They were the first step. This is the second step. But this is the completion. This is God in the flesh. And it's important to know that God calls Jesus the beloved. And you see, that is exactly the character of what they have seen in Jesus. He is the one, as you know, full of compassion, of loving kindness and in grace, who responds in love even when he's angry. It comes out of his love for them. Every single time. There is no place in the entire life and ministry of Jesus where you see a response that isn't the response of love for those to whom he was giving in ministry. Even when he cast out the money changers out of the temple, he was angry that that had happened because it misrepresented what he wanted them to see. 
the beloved. So, so what does it say to us? First of all, what it says is, is that all that God wishes to reveal to us as humans, we see in Jesus. We don't need to go anywhere else. He is the complete manifestation of God. And that not only is the complete manifestation of God, that the terrifying reaction of Peter is not appropriate because what we see is God the Beloved manifesting himself in the face of a human, someone approachable, someone who is kind, giving us the very essence of the nature of God, which is why Paul could say in, first, in uh, Colossians that Jesus is the exact likeness of the invisible God. <clears throat> In other words, I don't know what you think about who God is and who God isn't and what God's characteristics are. It's out there in the marketplace. You can find anybody who will agree with you. But a part of what this is being revealed is, if you really want to know who God is, look at the face of Jesus. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Jesus becomes for us literally the standard by which we determine what is of God and what is not of God. What describes God accurately and what does not describe God accurately. Believe me, if it doesn't look like Jesus, it's not God. No matter how lofty it might claim, no matter how religious it might sound, no matter how convincing it might be, no matter even how miraculous the things might happen around it, the devil knows how to make a miracle. No. What we see is all truth is in Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the light. The exact likeness of the invisible God. He becomes the one who shows us who God is and who he is like. And what that means is, is that he's approachable. I can come to him. Then I'm like Peter. I don't have to be afraid. Just the opposite. I can go to him knowing that even as he dealt with all of the people in the scripture, including the woman caught in adultery or the man born blind, it doesn't matter. How he responded to them is precisely how he's going to respond to me. Because he loves, he is the beloved. He loves me no less. He loves you no less. Do you believe that about Jesus? Can you trust him with all of your life? Do you understand that no matter how you come to him, whether it is in repentance, whether it is in joy, whether it is you want to share something wonderful that's happened to you, whether you want to ask God to help you because you need it, <coughs> that they're just like Jesus, responded to everyone, the woman at the well, you go... He'll res he responds that way to you. It's the same Jesus that we have seen the glory of God, His manifest <coughs> presence in the very human face of Jesus. And that gives us, as the college says at the beginning, strength. That no matter what I have to go through, I know I can go through it in the companionship of Jesus. He'll never leave me or forsake me. The phrase in the collect is, strengthen us to bear our cross. And there's a lot about life that feels like bearing a cross, right? Yeah, nod your head, we're in this together. But to know that I'm going through the things that I go through, not alone, not forsaken, but that instead I go literally strengthened by what we see in Jesus, the one who loves me and who cares for me. And speaks his healing grace into the deepest part of my soul. That, that's what we see in Jesus. So that even if I pay a price for being a Christian, I know I can continue to walk that way. Because I would rather pay a price for being a Christian and walk in the companionship of God than choose to live like a pagan and feel like I am alone in the universe. Because you see, that's the choice. That's the choice. There is no room in the Christian walk to say, I love Jesus and do whatever the heck you want. 
That's not walking in the companionship of Christ. Walking in the companionship of Christ is an invitation to walk with Him. Not going your way, going His way. Sure, we stray, but that's because we're humans and we can go to Him and ask for His forgiveness and He'll bring us right back. But the fact of the matter is, is that we choose not to walk in rebellion as far as it is possible for us. Because what we do not want is to walk outside of that place where we're walking with the promise that says, I will never leave you. We're dealing with God here, people. If you walk away from God, who will be your advocate? Who will stand for you at the great judgment seat of Christ if not God himself in Jesus? You're sunk. <laughs> You're just sunk. You see, just before this had happened, Jesus had said to his disciples, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. What does it profit then to gain the whole world but lose your soul? So the invitation in this story is to know that, number one, what we see in Jesus is God in the flesh. And that He is beloved. And that all that we see in Jesus is, in fact, ours in companionship with Him. And therefore, we can trust Him, no matter what's going on, knowing that we belong to Him and that He will never leave us. But to walk with Him asks of us a price. The price is, I'm not right at calling the shots anymore. I don't get to do whatever the heck I want. I'm in fact invited to come and to walk in companionship with Him. And knowing that it will in fact be costly. It is not always easy. But that is in fact the way we've been called to walk. Because Jesus did. This happens at this point because when they go down the mountain, then they're headed towards crucifixion and resurrection. This is the word of assurance that they needed so that when all of the awful things happens, they will remember who he was. So it is with us. We are also being invited, even in this upcoming Lent, to face the fact that we're paying a price for being a Christian and that it is not always easy. But we make the commitment to do so, even today, because we know to make that journey is in fact worth it. And even though the cost is high, I would rather go no other way. I do not want to walk away from the very companionship of the love, one who loves me more than anyone else in the world. We're about to move into confirmation. You will make commitments, reaffirming the things that you have said. This is the content of what is being asked of you when you call Him Lord. When you call, you say you will follow Him. These are the baptismal promises that we make. And we affirm this morning so on this, the last Sunday of Epiphany, as we head into Ash Wednesday, let today remind you that as you are being asked to pay a price to follow Christ, know that it is worth it and that He will never leave you or forsake you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you that you are entirely trustable because what we see in the face of Jesus is nothing less than the glory of God. Oh Lord, in those times when we are tempted to walk away, remind us of the power and the preciousness of what you've given us. Help us, oh Lord, in these days ahead to walk as your companion and know that all that we will ever need can be found in you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please turn now in your prayer book to page 415. They're going to bring a chair out. I'm going to sit in it. And the reason I do that is because this is a nod to sit and to administer is a nod to the ancient nature of the office. It used to be that when any public official, political or religious, um, what's the word? Spoke, performed in public. He did so sitting. That's why when Jesus stood before Pilate as the accused, what was Pilate doing? 